Well, good morning, folks. It's uh, really good to be with you again. Whenever people hear my South African accent, they ask me a question like, oh, so do you know so-and-so who also happens to be a South African? Well, there are only over 60 million South Africans and uh, about 150,000 or so living in this country. But yes, I do know Nick and Mariska. <laughs> Uh, this morning we're reading from Psalm 146, and it's on page uh, 632 in the Blue Church Bibles. I have my Bible with me to show you that's what we're looking at. The words are too small, so I've printed them out nice and big. Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and yes. earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. Well, before we take a look at that passage in some detail, let's uh, pray and ask God for his help as we look at his word. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for these words that you have spoken and that you still indeed speak today. An old word, but a word that is never outdated and is always true and reliable. Lord, would you help us now to understand it? Would you shape and fashion our hearts that we might love you more and love one another more? Amen. Amen. Well, Psalm 146 is a good place. It's a good psalm to consider as we think about uh, the elections that we've had recently, as we think about our new government and the future of our country. Verse 3 and 4 are particularly good for us to remember. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Do not put your trust in princes. But we so love to put our trust in princes, don't we? We're, we're so tired of the government that was ruling before. And then along comes a fresh new leader with fresh ideas, with a bright vision. And it's all going to be different this time. Across the Atlantic, they want to make America great again. Or locally, uh, we want to put the great back into Great Britain. The slogans are, are so predictable and exaggerated. And maybe for a short time, we actually believe them. But then the first mistakes are made. And we see the proof of human sinfulness. And eventually we sigh and we think to ourselves, I guess they're, I guess they're just human, like the last guy. We realize that he's not the Messiah and he's not going to bring the perfect, ideal life as a result of their election. And Psalm 146 explains to us why this is true. Now, don't worry, this morning isn't politically motivated. I'm not going to be telling you who you should be voting for, who you should have voted for, who I vote for. That's between you and the Lord. This morning is a spiritually motivated message. 
And Psalm 146 is going to help us have a better biblical view about politics and our leaders. And the psalm falls neatly into three sections. In verses 1 to 2, we have a brief introduction. And then in verses 3 to 4, we get the command not to trust in human leaders and the reasons why that's not a good idea. And the psalm ends in verses 5 to 10, where we switch our focus to the Lord as the one true God. And the reason why it is much, much, much better to put our hope in him. And then the psalm ends the way it began with the Hebrew word, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. This morning our focus is on the second and the third sections of the psalm. So let's look at verses 3 and 4 again. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Here we're told why it's a bad idea to put our trust in, in princes or human leaders. And the first thing we need to see is don't put your trust in them because they're not God. They're not God. They might like to think they are. But when push comes to shove, they can't deliver on their exaggerated promises. And when the Bible uses the word save or deliver, it doesn't just mean giving people a little bit extra, a little bit of extra help, a little bit of a nudge so that they can get the job done. That is not what the Bible means when it talks about save or deliver. It, it's nothing like asking for a hint while playing solitaire on your phone. Play games on your phone and you, it says, oh, I'll give you a hint. Watch a video and you get a hint. It's nothing like that. It's not going to give you a little helping hand. Save deliverance means more like saving people from something that had total power over them. They are totally overpowered by it. Something we're totally totally unable to do ourselves helpless we should think of the israelite slaves in egypt totally under the dictatorial power of pharaoh god didn't look at them and say they'll be able to help themselves if i just give them a little bit of a a bit of a helping hand they just need a little bit of a help no the situation was was desperate it was dire the slaves had absolutely no hope at all of freeing themselves. So for a prince or a earthly leader to, to claim to be a deliverer, the one who could save was like them claiming to be God. A bit like the Roman emperor at the time of Jesus, who had Savior as one of his official titles. And it must have looked like Caesar Augustus had a good claim to that title. He was a very powerful man. He could pardon a person to be executed. He commanded vast legions of, of highly skilled soldiers and was ruling over the whole Roman Empire. And when he said jump, the only question was how high? But while the Roman emperors were sitting on their thrones congratulating themselves on the extent of their empire and how powerful they were, an unknown village with an unknown carpenter in Galilee. And he was starting a ministry that would affect the lives of billions of people around the world and would change the course of world history. And now 2,000 years later, we hardly think about those Roman emperors, but millions of people, millions and billions of people all around the world called Jesus their Savior, their Deliverer. So the human rulers, they can't provide ultimate help because they're not God. And the second reason they can't help us is because they won't last long enough. They're not going to be around long enough. Now, I don't often quote from the message, but the message translates verse 4 like this. When they die, their projects die with them 
the books of 1 and 2 Kings in the Old Testament make for some pretty depressing reading. In the books of Kings, there were only two ways that the kings are described. The kings of Israel and Judah, they're described like this. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, or he did what was wrong in the eyes of the Lord. I want to suggest that you read one king. It will bless your heart. Or better yet, get Dale Ralph Davies's book on one kings, The Wisdom and the Folly. It so clearly points to a need for a better, the best king, the King Jesus. And there are two sad truths running through uh, one and two kings. And it's this. First, there are a whole lot more kings who did what was wrong in the eyes of the Lord. Many, many, many more. And then secondly, even those kings who did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, the good they achieved didn't last long. And they were followed by a king, a bad king, who undid all that they had done. Today, government leaders, whether that's a prime minister or a president, they've even got a shorter time to do the good they want to do. One election, maybe two or even three if they're lucky. Or lately, maybe not even completing a month. But even 15 years isn't long enough to solve some of the most difficult problems we face today. Never mind 10 or 5 years. And when governments are defeated, what happens? They tend to be defeated by a new government that disagrees with key parts of their governing. So the chances are pretty good that a lot of the things they try to achieve are going to be reversed by the new government. Verse 10 says this, the Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. In ancient ancient times, people sometimes said something like, may the king live forever. But they probably didn't actually want him to live forever. And whether they wanted to wanted him to or not, he wasn't going to anyway. God is the only one for whom the words forever and all generations can apply. He is the only one that those words can be true of. All generations. Forever. No one else is going to be around long enough if they were good enough. To be able to get the job done. So we shouldn't trust in princes or politicians because they aren't God. And because they aren't going to be around long enough. There is a third reason, and it's not specifically mentioned in the psalm, but it's assumed throughout the whole Bible. It's the fact that princes, politicians, and all human leaders are all sinners, just like the rest of us. And let's not forget that the word sin, uh, let's not forget what it means in the Bible. It's providential that in English the word sin has I in the middle. Have you ever wondered why Apple products, it's called an iPhone, an iWatch, an iPad, an iPod? It's all about me. It's all about me. When I'm at the center of my own life, when I'm being selfish and self-centered and acting as if, as if uh, I was God of my own world, in biblical terms, I'm living like a sinner. We all do it. Some of us do it more than others, and sometimes we do it more than other times. No one doesn't sin at all. We all know the saying, all power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. What that means is that it's very hard for ordinary sinners to resist the temptation of feathering their own nests and ruling for their own benefit. It's not that it can't be done, it's just that it's really, really difficult. So it shouldn't surprise us when we see corruption in government leaders. Think about this for a second. 
How confident are you that you'd be able to resist the temptation if you were in their shoes? In Tolkien's book, The Fellowship of the Ring, Frodo can't even give the one ring. He can't give that ring to any one of the other members of the fellowship. He can't give it to any of the other good guys in the story. Why? Because he knew it would corrupt their good hearts. We get angry at politicians for sins that we commit ourselves. Except that we aren't in positions of public power and authority when we commit them. But we commit the same sins. Someone once said that you know a politician is lying when their mouth is moving. And it's great that we laugh because hopefully it's an ironic laugh because the same is true of us. We're all guilty of a little truth bending for our own benefit. Do not put your trust in princes. That doesn't mean that we should be disrespectful of our political leaders or that we shouldn't do our best to elect people of competency and character. The kind of people who've had some success in resisting the temptation of corruption. It's right for us to get involved in the political process and to try and get the best possible candidates into office. It's right that we vote and that we write letters to our MPs. But we shouldn't put our hopes for making a better country or a better world on the shoulders of those people. It's a burden they cannot bear because they aren't God. They're not going to be around long enough. And they just don't have the ability to be perfect. Don't put your trust in human princes. So what the psalmist does then is he says, well, you need to look for a better king. You need to look for a better prince. A much more capable deliverer. And we see that in verses 5 to 10. Blessed are those whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever, your God, O Zion, for all generations. So God's creative power makes him a worthy object of our hope. You see, he is the one who made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. I think that verse is on the window as you come in or a verse similar to it. As you go out, one of the windows is a Bible verse. It might be that one. was very close to it. See, some of today's world leaders have it in their power to use their nuclear weapons to destroy life on earth. But none of them have the power to create the heavens and the earth. With today's technology, they'd be dead long before they reached Alpha Centauri, the closest star system to our own. Never mind trying to create it in the first place. And there are billions of star systems, most of them unimaginable distances from the earth, all of them completely out of reach of our earthly leaders. But God, in his wisdom, created them all. And he knows them all intimately. We measure the world, in the universe, in light years. The Bible tells us that God measures the universe, the span of his hand. Yeah, that's about right. Maybe that's what it would be. See, this great creator God is also a God over all of that. 
But then he has a special concern for the poor, for the needy, and the oppressed. Verse 7 to 9 tells us that he executes justice for the oppressed, his food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord watches over the strangers. He upholds the orphan and the widow. Some politicians will appoint assistants to help them with the job. And who gets, what are the jobs that the assistants get? All the rubbish jobs that they, the person thinks is just kind of below them. They'll do all the important jobs. They'll give everything to the assistant, not God. Creates the expanse of the universe, but then he has time for the outcasts in, in the community, the widows, the orphans, the hungry, the oppressed, the prisoners. See, this is the story of the God of the Bible. He's the God who went down to Egypt to deliver the oppressed slaves and to bring them home into their own land. See, he is the God who used a little shepherd boy to defeat the mighty warrior Goliath and set his people free from Philistine attack. He is the God who cared for the widow of Zarephath and sent Elijah down to help her and her son to make it through the drought. He is the God who came and lived among us in Jesus to set people free from the power of evil spirits, to give the blind people their sight and to reach out to marginalized people, tax collectors, prostitutes, enemy soldiers and Galilean fishermen. He's the God who came to save, who came to rescue, who came to deliver. The fantastic thing about the story is that not only does God care for the poor and the humble, he tends to use the poor and the humble to help them too. See, God's way of changing the world isn't usually to win a celebrity, a general, or a president over to his cause. Denzel Washington, Chuck Norris, Justin Bieber, Tom Hanks, Jane Fonda, Stormzy, Chris Pratt, and our late queen all claim to be Christians. But there's no evidence to suggest that they've had a bigger influence than anyone else. God's way is to choose somebody completely ordinary. Someone who just goes humbly about their daily tasks. Doing the best to serve their God and to love other people. And then God uses them to change the world. Does anybody know who Francesco Bernadon is. Francesco Bernadon. He became St. Francis of Assisi. He was known for caring for the poor and the underprivileged. Dr. Paul Brand, Brand or Brunt, if you're South African, he went as a medical missionary to I India and he ended up making some of the most important discoveries that helped us understand the secrets of leprosy. A shy little Irish boy called Clive who lost his mum to cancer at an early age and who loved stories about the gods and the goddesses of Asgard. But he went on to become one of the most influential Christian writers of the 20th century. Do you know who that is? C.S. Lewis. We've only thought about a few people who became famous, but what about the millions who don't become famous? We don't know about. Philip Yancey has done thousands of interviews in his career as a writer. He says that in his mind, uh, he tends to divide the people he interviews into two groups, the stars and the servants. Uh, the Bentleys and the Vauxhalls. And it's very clear to him that the servants, mostly unknown men and women, working faithfully in obscure places to improve the lives of ordinary people, to share the gospel with them, are the ones who've discovered the real secret to contentment 
and happiness. Verse 5, blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. What does this, what does this actually mean? Well, it sounds pious and, and good and holy, but do we really think that a humble charity worker Here in New Milton, we're in the middle of Africa somewhere, is having more of an effect on the world than the British Prime Minister. Or that ordinary Christians like, like you and me, that, that we can do more to advance the cause or the plan of God than a Joe Biden or a Ursula uh, von der Leyen. How does God actually help and save those who put their hope in him? Well, let's suppose that we decide to take the advice of the psalmist and that we're no longer going to put our hope in a, a, Rishi, a Rishi Sunak or a Keir Starmer. We're not going to rely on Nigel Farage or Joe Swinney or Ed Davey or whoever your favorite politician might be. No, we're going to put our hope in the Lord. We put our hope in the Lord, our God. We're going to trust in the God who comes to live among us in Jesus. The one who lives forever. The one who is powerful. The one who creates all things. The one who is the one true living God. You see, if we trust our doctor, well, what do we do? Well, we do what he or she says. Wake up in the morning, do your exercises, take your medicine. And so we wake up in the morning and we do our exercises. We put the advice into practice in our daily lives. And the same should be true with God. If we put our hope and trust in God, then we will do what he says. We ask him to fill us with the Holy Spirit and to give us strength to do the things we can't do by ourselves. And then we take the words and the example of Jesus and try to put them into practice in our own lives, loving our enemies, forgiving those who hurt us, that's really hard, isn't it? I've got particular hurt at the moment, and every single day I wake up, I have to pray and ask the God, Lord, help me to forgive them. That's hard, but imagine if we all did that. I have to pray because I can't do it by myself. Imagine if we all reached out to the poor and the needy and the marginalized. Imagine if we all spread the news that there's a God of love who cares and saves and has, uh, cares about everyone he has made. To tell them that Jesus alone is Lord. Great, I heard uh, Gary went to Paris. But we don't need to go to Paris. Hi, neighbor. Let me tell you about Jesus. Do you know how many sugars your neighbors take in their tea and coffee invite them over speak to them that would have a tremendous impact on the world wouldn't it imagine millions of people following jesus together uh, learning to be his disciples doing the things he had told us to do you see would they hurt others and be filled with greed course not would they look after themselves at the expense of others would they take advantage of the poor and the vulnerable no would they look for opportunities to as john wesley put it to do all the good they can to all the people they can in all the ways they can by all the means they can as long as they ever can of course they would and that's how god changes the world not by a larger-than-life politician with fake hair and feet of clay, fake tan, but by his power at work in hundreds and thousands of ordinary people. People like me and people like you. We don't have to have everything together in our lives. You don't. We don't even have to have all the answers. We just need a thankful trust in God 
to put our hope in God. A determination not to allow anyone or anything else to take God's place and a desire to hear God's word and to put it into practice in our daily lives. And when we do that, God will work through us to execute justice for the oppressed, give food to the hungry, set the prisoners free, open the eyes of the blind, lift up those who are bowed down, watch over the stranger and uphold the orphan and the widow and save lives. See, that's what God will do through you and me if we put our hope in him and in no one else but him. Now, don't, don't, don't misunderstand this. The emphasis here isn't on our actions. It's not on what we do. It's not about all those good things we've just spoken about. It's not, that's not where the emphasis is. The emphasis is, <coughs> the emphasis is on the God that we hope in. We hope in him. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. And when we do that, when our hope is in the Lord, we'll look at verses 1 and 2 and we'll be able to say them with confidence. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, would you please forgive us when we put our hope in the wrong people? in the wrong things. Lord, would you help us to hope in you and you alone, that we will trust in you and you alone. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to sing our final, final hymn, our final song, Holy Spirit, Living Breath of God. Spirit, living breath of God, bring new life into my willing soul. Bring the presence of the risen Lord to renew my heart and make me whole. Cause your word to come alive in me. Give me faith for what I cannot see. Give me passion for your purity. Holy Spirit, breathe new life in me. Spirit, come abide within, may your joy be seen in all I do. Love enough to cover every sin, in each thought and deed and attitude. Kindness to the greatest and the least. Gentleness that sows the path of peace, earnestly striving into works of grace, show Christ in all I do. Holy Spirit, from creation's birth, giving life to all that God has made. 
Show your power once again on earth. Cause your church to hunger for your ways. Let the fragrance of our praise lead us on the road of sacrifice. That in unity the face of Christ will be clear for all the world to see. This evening we're looking at Psalm 23. It's a psalm that is very close to many of our hearts, especially to mine. A friend of mine passed away recently and there were three things that were very clear to her. She loved the Lord. She loved her husband, her David. And she loved Elvis. And she loved Psalm 23. And this evening they're having a Thanksgiving service for her and I thought it would be fitting for us to take a look at Psalm uh, 23 as well. So do join us for Psalm 23. I want to close with these words from Jude. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.